Good evening. My name is Janet Miner, and I am the treasurer of the Law Society. I'd like to thank you for your presence here today, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our annual International Women's Day celebration. Au nom du barreau, j'ai le grand plaisir de vous souhaiter la bienvenue à notre célébration annuelle de la Journée Internationale de la Femme. We acknowledge that we are meeting on the traditional territories of the Mississauga of New Credit First Nation. I'd like to thank our partners for organizing today's event with us, the Women's Law Association of Ontario, the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund, LEAF, the Women Lawyers Forum of the Ontario Bar Association, and the Barbara Schleifer Commemorative Clinic. Thank you for your ongoing support and promotion of the event. These events uh, in our public uh, series serve to encourage the exchange of information, ideas, and ways of action on legal issues relating to the rights and needs of equality-seeking groups. It's part of our ongoing commitment to promote equity and diversity in the legal professions. To mark today's occasion, we've assembled a distinguished panel of speakers who will have a dialogue on women's experiences of sexual violence from an interdisciplinary and intergenerational perspective. Sexual violence, unfortunately, is an issue that is prevalent in our communities and that has received much media attention recently as a result of a few high-profile cases. The Law Society is committed to providing opportunities for licensing candidates, licensees, and members of the public to increase their knowledge of sexual harassment and violence and to understand what constitutes acceptable conduct. Let me share with you some of the initiatives the Law Society has taken to address the issue of sexual harassment and violence. In addition to dedicating today's public education event to sexual violence awareness, the Law Society has created an educational guide for lawyers and paralegals on providing legal services in cases involving claims of sexual abuse, as well a model policy on preventing harassment, discrimination and violence in the legal workplace is also available. The Law Society offers continuing professional development programs focused on criminal and family law, which integrate the topics of sexual violence and lawyer representation of clients. In fact, domestic violence will be the subject of a judge's panel at the Law Society's 2015 Family Law Summit, taking place on March 30th and March 31st. We also intend to sponsor a colloquium for members of the profession uh, particularly members of uh, the prosecution side and the defense bars, uh, including members of the judiciary who will be invited to attend to discuss relevant provisions of the rules of professional conduct as it applies in criminal proceedings. In addition to continuing professional development programs through our CPD department, the Law Society's Equity Initiatives, Design, Equity Initiatives Department, headed by Jose Bouchard, designs and delivers customized programs on topics of equity and diversity, including harassment and discrimination for law firms and legal organizations. We are particularly proud of our Discrimination and Harassment Council Program, or DHC program as we call it, which was established in 1999. The DHC confidentially assists anyone who may have experienced discrimination or harassment by a lawyer or a paralegal, and that includes not just staff or associates, but clients uh, and support staff. This program is free of charge, and it's funded by the Law Society, but it operates separately, independently, and as I said, it is totally confidential. The, the uh, Discrimination and Harassment Council will uh, provide mediation services if requested, but only if requested, and it is a safe place to discuss some very personal and difficult issues. The Law Society is committed to promoting equity and diversity in the profession and to contributing to the creation of a safe space for all Ontarians. We're privileged to have the opportunity to hear today from a range of exceptional voices on the subject of sexual violence and to have a space to have a respectful and open dialogue on this extremely important issue. I'd like to thank all of the panelists for being here with us today. 
So I hope you'll join us afterwards for a reception upstairs. And uh, if you don't quite know where that is, staff will be directing you. I think you can probably follow the herd. And uh, I'd like now to introduce you to our discussion moderator to begin the program. program. Farah Khan is a counselor and educator who has 10, sorry, 16 years of experience working to address gender-based violence. She holds a Master of Social Work from the University of Toronto and supports women who are survivors of violence as a counselor at the Barbara Schleifer Clinic. The clinic specializes in meeting the needs of immigrant and refugee women and assists more than 4,000 women a year. At the clinic, she is the coordinator of Outburst, Young Muslim Women's Project. Outburst is an opportunity for young Muslim women to determine the ways in which they define and access safety. Through Outburst, Farah has conducted training across Canada on forced marriage, as well as developed a risk assessment safety planning tool on honor-related violence and forced marriage that is currently being piloted nationally. With Femifesto, Farah co-authored reporting on sexual assault, a toolkit for Canadian media. The second edition will be launched in May 2015. Farah is regularly sought out by national media, including the CBC and Globe and Mail, for her expertise in violence against women. For her community work, Farah has been presented with numerous awards, including the Toronto Vital People Award. Please join me in welcoming Farah Khan. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so excited to be here and I wanted to thank the Law Society for organizing this event along with the other organizations. Um, I have to say that I live and breathe violence against women in the way that I think about it all the time. And probably to the chagrin of my family, which they're probably tired of me talking about it at family parties, they're tired of me bringing it up. Probably many of us in this room are that person that's kind of the annoying person at the party or I don't know about you, but I kind of shut down a party conversation when they ask me what I do. But I know, you know what I'm saying? They're trying to pick you up and you're like, actually, I work in violence against women. And then it's like, oh, I'm going to go somewhere else. But I know that it's important. And we know that it's happening at epidemic rates in Canada. And we know that what just happened a couple months ago and everybody was saying, oh, this is a watershed moment. It wasn't for many of us in this room because we've had many watershed moments. We've had many times in Canada to which we've had discussions about violence against women, where women have stood up and said, no more. When young men have said, no more. When Aboriginal women and Indigenous women are saying, no more. I come here today in very much in awe of the people on this panel and the people in this room, because many of you have paved the way for me to do the work that I'm doing here. Many of you have created the space to which we can do the work. And today we're going to explore that. We're going to explore how this work has come about, what we need to do going forward, what could consent look like in the future, how we want to create a society where victims are not blamed. If I have to hear again, what were you wearing? What were you doing there? What were you thinking? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of it. And I'm tired of hearing the idea that there's something wrong with us as survivors and not something wrong with perpetrators. I want to live in a culture that supports consent. I want to live in a culture that doesn't support rape. And the rape culture we exist in right now in Canada needs to change. And so today we're going to have that conversation. And I'm so excited to welcome the panelists here today. And I welcome all of you here to bring your questions, bring your observations, and also bring your full selves, knowing that many of us in this room are survivors. So we take breaths. We remind ourselves that we are here. We say loving things to ourselves. And we thank ourselves for surviving, because we are. We're amazing people, because we are here now. So I'm going to first um, welcome Mary Egbert. Uh, Eberts. <laughs> Thank you. And I always get mad at people for saying my name wrong, and now I just did that to you. I'm so sorry. Um, and Mary is a constitutional lawyer and the co-founder of the Women's Legal Education and Action Fund. Mary Eberts is a lawyer based in Toronto who does human rights, women's rights, and indigenous rights cases in many parts of Canada. She received her legal education at Western and Harvard and has taught law and practice in a large firm and founded her own small advocacy firm in Toronto. She held the Gordon Henderson Chair in Human Rights at U of Ottawa, 2004 to 2005, and the Ariel Swallows Chair in Human Rights at U 
of Saskatchewan 2011-2012. In the fall of 2014, was a constitutional litigator in residence at David Asper's Asper Center at the Faculty of Law of U of Toronto. Mary is a co-founder of Women's Legal a Education Action Fund and sat on the first board of the directors of METRAC. She was a bencher in 1995 to 1999 and has received the Law Society Medal and Medal in the Honor of the Persons Case. Please welcome Mary. Far, I had such a moment of fellow feeling with you when you said that about how people regard you at parties. <laughs> because I remember coming ho driving home from a party many years ago now with my husband, and he was quite chagrined. And he looked over at me from his position behind the wheel of the car, and he said, you know, he said, you're just going to have to learn to be more trivial. <laughs> Well, it's something I never mastered. And uh, what I'd like to talk to you about tonight, or what I'd like to start out with tonight, is uh, some reflections on the role of the law and the role of the legal system in s perpetuating the culture of violence against women. In fact, in, in many cases, in structuring it and making it very difficult to eradicate it. And I... Uh, I came to this thought, this set of thoughts, through the work that I've done with uh, Indigenous women and the Sisters in Spirit program, which started in 2005. And I'm pleased that one of the founders of the Sisters in Spirit program, Bev Jacobs, who is then the president of the Native Women's Association, is, is here. She just came in uh, today, or I would have uh, lobbied to get her on this panel. <laughs> And it, it uh, occurred to me, and I've done some writing about this, that in creating the structures of a colonizing country, Canada used the law, namely the Indian Act, to take away from women their roles in their own indigenous nations, their roles as leaders, as elders, as wise people, as economic agents, as just about anything, as, uh, and um, also, then um, took away their children and put them in residential school. So that by the law, the law of Canada, indigenous women were made civil nothings. They had no public identity. They had no identity in law. They were in fact created as a population of prey and they were uh, available for people to um, attack at will with impunity. And I have long uh, thought and written about this, and it was just in the past couple of years that I started thinking, you know, we, I have learned a lot from Indigenous women and their struggles against the, um, the way they are treated, and particularly in the way that ceremony is used to confer dignity and identity on the victims of violence uh, by the whole community and uh, dignity and uh, respect are accorded to uh, women who suffer these fates. And Canada is still colonizing. The Indian Act of Canada actually was reformed in 1985, and the situation of women in many respects was made worse under the 1985 laws than it was made than it was before. And uh, so we're not uh, out of that particular woods yet. But recently I've been thinking about, uh, you know, the, the approach of Canada in the 1850s when it encountered the indigenous population was the approach of Victorian England. And the Indian bands that were created were like little Victorian villages or fiefdoms. And then I'm thinking, okay, Victorian England, well, we need to broaden the lens, I need to broaden my lens to look at the role of law and, the, and particularly the role of criminal law in creating, the, creating and perpetuating and strengthening the culture of violence against women. And that happens in two ways and one of them is fixable. 
One of them is in the substance of the law, the provisions of the criminal code that deal with when something will be considered rape, what are the prerequisites for proving rape, do you need to show uh, that there was, uh, you know, that, um, that there was a recent complaint, for example, an ancient part of the law of, of sexual assault. But even more importantly, we have the whole structure of the criminal law, and that is a person is innocent until proven guilty. Well, most persons who commit rape are men, and most persons who are raped are women. And uh, so a person is considered innocent until proven guilty. And so it is really the woman in the hands of the Crown Attorney and the police who have to prove that the offense took place. And this is not an even playing field. In the very structure of our criminal law, the person who alleges that there has been an assault is uh, working uphill. And there are many, many, many cases that are never taken because sensible women do not want to be interrogated by the police, interrogated by healthcare people, interrogated again by the specialist police, interrogated by the Crown attorneys, and then devastatingly interrogated by the defense counsel. And so they just opt out of the system. And so what happens is that the criminal law creates a false discourse of innocence so that if a person, if a male person is not proven to be guilty, then the, he is innocent. And so there are all these men around who have committed violence against women that our society considers as innocent. And so what's the corollary of that? It is that the woman is at fault. What was she wearing? What was she doing? And so the very criminal law, the very mechanics of the criminal law is part of our problem here. Thank you so much, Mary. And we're gonna have comments from each one of the panelists and we're gonna then open it up to some questions. Um, but I think Mary really set the tone of, of what we really are, that we're on, we're on stolen land and that we are, this country has been based on, on laws that really reprimand and harm victims and survivors. And now we're gonna hear from Lenore Lucas Voss. Close, Close. Lukasik. Lukasik, okay. gosh, Farcon. Um, Lenore Lukasik Voss, there you got it. Has been working in the women's anti-violence movement for over 25 years and is currently the director of SASHA, the Sexual Assault Center in Hamilton area and the chair of the Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers. Thank you so much. I am th also thrilled to be here. Thank you, event organizers, um, for putting on such an amazing and timely event and to be able to celebrate International Women's Day, International Women's Week, actually, with uh, such a very cool panel of women. So I'm honored to be here. I'm going to um, focus my opening remarks. I'm going to look at the clock first to keep myself on track and focus my remarks on kind of two areas. Um, that really I could spend just two hours talking about, but I won't. Um, so I want to talk about how tactics, how activist tactics have shifted over the last 30 to 40 years around sexual violence. And I'm going to use the frame of public education or prevention campaigns as the backdrop. That is not all activism for sexual violence, but that's one component that I, I believe elucidates how we have thought about the issue and the, the kinds of things we have pushed for as activists. And then I'm going to talk briefly about how um, our discussion of, of high-profile cases of sexual violence have shifted, um, and not so much, um, but kind of in the last six months, really, but, you know, over the last 25 years for sure. But I've noticed some real um, interesting things happened in the last six months. So... Um, the first thing I, I wanted to talk about, as I said, is around how we have done our activism for sexual violence. And um, my organization is a great place to start because we were founded in 1975, yay, 40th anniversary of Sasha this year. So we were one of the third rape crisis centers in, um, or one of the third, we were the third in Canada. And when we opened, we were the rape 
um, crisis center of Hamilton. And then in the mid 80s, we changed to the sexual assault center so that we would be in line with the changes to the legislation that took away rape and added sexual assault in, le in levels. And that um, around that time, we saw campaigns of sexual assault as a crime. And that was paralleling work that's happening in domestic violence or woman abuse or partner violence. And that was like wife assault, which is interesting language, is a crime. Woman abuse is a crime. And it was very much... Um, emphasizing criminal response and criminal justice and that we were uh, pushing for important reforms. And don't get me wrong, those were essential. Prior to 1982, a man could rape his uh, wife or partner uh, without uh, any legal recourse. But I would argue that that exists still today, despite changes in the law that men are raping their wives without legal recourse or impact at, at all. So really echoing what Mary was saying. Um, and then we saw a lot of campaigns focusing on consent. And that's still the case. And I'm not saying that any of these campaigns are bad. There's just some evolution in, in terms of what we're emphasizing and what we were asking for. And so you saw a lot of no means no campaigns and that those still exist. And then we are seeing shifts and tweaks to the yes means yes. And now it's the yes question or yes um, exclamation mark. So enthusiastic yes means yes. And all these conversations around consent and negotiating consent, but still really you can see even in, in, in in that dialogue were tied to a criminal justice response around did we did they get consent because you didn't have consent that's sexual assault and and um, and it, that's important and we need to teach consent thank God the sexual health curriculum has been updated so we're going to start to talk about that but um, that's that alone is not going to end sexual violence um, but so really the legal system we see in in this world becomes the yardstick of the experience of this of whether you're a survivor or not. Um, and it becomes almost like our ground that we are circling around always. Um, and I really question that. I'm, all activists are questioning that. Um, and then we start to see the language of sexual violence. So our, our talk tonight is not about sexual assault. It's about sexual violence. And that... Um, I see that as a few things happening, which is that we're emphasizing that this is violence um, and that sex is the medium or the tool, but the underpinning um, is that this is about violence that is rooted in sexism, racism, colonialism, heterosexism. That's the foundation of why we have sexual violence. Sex is the tool, and that's really confusing for people. It's not about uncontrollable urges, but I think we get caught up in that dialogue, and that really frames how we talk about survivors and what she was wearing and, and was she drinking, um, because we, we, we get it wrong. And so our campaigns are trying to look at that. Sexual violence is also broader, and that includes things like street harassment, which many parts of... of of uh, those kinds of activities are not against the law. So we're broadening that. Um, so we're shifting away from criminal remedies or responses. And we're looking at bystander campaigns now. So we're trying to disrupt sexual violence before it happens, get bystanders involved. So you're hearing a lot about um, what are you doing? Are you laughing at rape jokes? If you see something shady happening in a club, are you intervening when that person who is stumbling out is being led away somewhere? So it's, it's about helping people do that. So you can see that we've really shifted from our focus and, have, and many of us um, in this field have started to question whether the criminal system um, is even possible at doing any kind of a survivor sensitive um, response. Um, very quickly, last but not least, I need to mention social media and the massive um, impact this has had around this work. When we look at um, even something like Twitter, which it's hard to imagine, you know, how much dialogue is that causing? That's huge when we look at things like hashtag been raped, never reported, or am I next for indigenous, um, murdered and missing indigenous women, and the impact that these are stories are being picked up in mainstream media. So very briefly, our campaigns are saying a lot about what we're focusing on. Um, to sum up in my one and a half minute or one minute, zero minutes I have, very quickly, um, I just want to uh, again talk about how things have changed for me in parties and events where people would back away from me when they found out where I worked. There was about a two month period during the high profile cases where that's all everyone ever wanted to talk about in my coffee shop, in the library. I was all of a sudden a really fascinating person that you didn't run away from at parties. <laughs> Um, and um, that was a, both exhausting and exciting. So I am not a Pollyanna. I get that, that these high-profile cases are not permanently shifting the ground we sit on. There have been many watershed moments, and there are lots of voices left out of the conversation. I also have to add, sorry, social media creating space for people that haven't had space before. Hooray. Um, marginalized women. So I just want to end by saying, I'm ending. Thank you, Farah. You are keeping me on track. Is that... 
Um, I can say the term rape culture now and not have people look at me like I have two heads. And I can also seriously question the criminal justice system and not have my organization be really questioned about being too out there or too feminist. So that's, um, I think, an interesting development. Thank you. Thank you, Lenore. So this conference, this um, not conference, this talk is an intergenerational talk. We wanted to make sure that we included many voices here. And as you can see, um, in the movement, we sometimes have people like Mary, who has so much experience. I'm not going to single it, but I am singling you out. Um, and then we also have young women that have been pushing back against rape culture and asking questions in their, we saw young women in their grade school, like we give consent, that young, young women from Toronto asking, can we have consent in the curriculum? And we see young women in programs like Metrac, and we have Wendy D'Souza here with us from Metrac, who is feeling, um, took the lovely kindness of her heart to take um, this place of a news who was supposed to be here today, but sadly is sick. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about Wendy. So Wendy Wendy D'Souza is passionate about community organizing and working with her community. She believes strongly in radical education and ending gender-based violence. Currently, she works as a youth um, facilitator at the Metropolitan Action Committee on Violence Against Women and Children, an organization promoting the rights of women and youth to live free from violence and the threat of violence. Yay. Welcome, Wendy. Thank you, everyone, for having me here today. Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, just to have the priority to have a space for a youth voice. I feel like that's very important um, in the time and going through what we're going through. I'd like to thank Anuth, and I really want to do Anuth some justice for the amazing points uh, and the great research that she did on this topic. Uh, but today, I am from Metrac and I'm a youth facilitator, so I work with a lot of young people across the city uh, from various diverse groups, uh, different income brackets, and also different spiritual and religious backgrounds. So I am kind of qualified to talk about young people, and really today what I'll be speaking about is how young people are mobilizing online in a really powerful way and also how young people are kind of like decentering this idea um, that really there's this expert status and only experts can talk about uh, sexual assault and violence against women and young people are really shifting and taking a lead on that narrative and that conversation. So I'll be touching base a little bit about that. I wanted to start with um, social media and I thank you so much. You were just really plugging in a lot of what I'm about to say right now. Uh, but really, young people are using social media in a fascinating way. I know that you see kids every day with their cell phone texting, on Instagram, scrolling, but a lot of them are really connecting with one another. People really think that activism on social media, they have this term called slacktivism. So they think, oh, that's not real activism. You guys are all behind your phones. Anyone can say anything, right? But it's what they're choosing to do with that, um, that tool that they have. So really... It's an innovative and very strategic way to mobilize people. Very easy to get a lot of people together uh, in a safe way to do it. Also, millions of people are using social media. We can have global conversations now about women's issues and women's rights all over the world and really create some type of solidarity with one another. Um, I also wanted to talk that these organized these conversations we're having worldwide, like you said, really creates a platform for marginalized women, women of color, transgender, gender fluid, you know, just women in general to really talk about these issues, women that never really had a platform, women without education, women with education. It's really diverse, the people that are able to now interact and engage in this conversation about sexual assault. Um, also, it's really gained a, a lot of, a large spread kind of respect for what we're doing. You know, people kind of look at us at parties, but I'm able to go on social media and post stuff. And people, you know, I'll get a like and I'll get a little respect like, hey, Wendy, I didn't like your picture, but you're really cool. I love the stuff you post. And I'll be like, well, why don't you like it then and share it? But, you know, people are really taking notice and, you know, they're, very, they're being grateful that they see all this information and they're able to do something about it. Um, it's a really a great way and a safe way for young people to engage. There's many reasons why people can't go on the street and protest. Uh, one thing about education, not everyone has access to help through the law system. People have many jobs. Sometimes I can't leave my job that I need to pay my truly expensive rent and take care of my kids. I can't protest because I have a job and I have bills to pay. Also safety. A lot of people don't want to deal with the repercussions of being that person on the street and being targeted by police, by government officials. You know, it's really scary and it can be truly triggering uh, when we're talking about these issues. Like, 
you were talking and I was just having a tear about, you know, just the history of indigenous people. A lot of us are survivors. So to be there fighting in the front line can be truly triggering. Um, so I think social media is being used powerfully by a lot of women who can't be there in the forefront but are trying to really uh, spread the word of what we can do. Quickly, I don't know how much time, but I did want to plug in one um, project uh, that was done through social media. It's called the We Give Consent Project, and we had these two 13-year-old girls named Leah and Tessa who started this petition online really using Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, and they got over like 40,000 signatures, and they wanted to really start talking about consent um, and really battling that in the school system, and now, hey, we got Premier Win introducing consent this fall. I don't think that's a coincidence, but um, I think it's really getting people involved in the conversation, getting that power, collecting that power together, and being able to present it to you know, government officials and say, this is what the people want. And now the wheels are in motion. Some people are happy about that, some people are not. But the point is, at least consent is being introduced. Now we can mold and shape how we want to uh, present that to the diverse youth that we have in the city of Toronto. And these young ladies, they're completing this documentary on rape culture. I think it's due out in June. And also what they want to do is continue creating like YouTube videos um, on issues of sexual violence and consent that they can really show to their peers. So this is young people using multimedia to, um, to teach their peers about what they can do and how they can fight against sexual assault. So honestly, young people is just a promising future. And we look forward to you guys, everyone out here, to support young people, be patient, and really support them in having a lead in our future. Yeah. I'm a good substitute, right? You're more than a Ooh, went by quick, darn. <laughs> She was all like, I don't know if I'm prepared. I'm just going to read these notes. <laughs> let, me, let me go no, through them. Just go. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, oh, Wendy. Thank you for having me. Um, so the next person we have is Melanie Randall. Um, she's the Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law at Western University. And Melanie Randall, PhD in LLB, is an Associate Professor at the, West, the Faculty of Law at Western University. Her academic and advocacy work mainly focuses on legal remedies for gendered violence. Her publications have analyzed legal constructions of ideal victims in domestic violence and sexual assault criminal cases, consent, credibility, and the criminal law of sexual assault, judicial misunderstandings of marital rape, legal misunderstandings of women's responses to violence and abuse, and comparative approaches to asylum claims based on gender persecution and refugee law, and using law to seek state accountability for inequality. That's a lot of good stuff. She has also written on complex trauma in the lives of Indigenous people and the need for trauma-informed legal approaches. She is currently working on a collaborative research with the Equality Effect involving human rights lawyers and community activists from Canada and three African countries, Kenya, Ghana, and Maui. The project aims to challenge the legal impunity for sexual assault of children and marital rape using criminal law, constitutional equality rights, guarantees, and community education. Welcome, Melanie. Thank you. I'd also like to thank the organizers for, um, for this event and for including me. And it's so exciting to have an opportunity to have a discussion together about these uh, very important and complicated issues around which I think there's still a lot of um, stigma and misunderstanding and uh, shame and fear and um, a lot of uh, complicated issues to navigate. And one thing in thinking about law for me is um, that there's this paradox. And I think Mary Eberts talked very eloquently about uh, law's role in creating oppression and marginalization. So that law is uh, a site of the problem, but it's also potentially a transformative source of power and uh, a tool for social justice. So it's, it's it, sort of navigating that complexity is something I think will be interesting to talk about. I want to very briefly begin by touching upon what I think are some statutory successes around um, criminal law. And uh, maybe that's just a survival strategy because there is so much to depress us in this topic <laughs> um, that we need to look sometimes at our successes. And there, there actually have been a lot. Um, and I think we, we should be proud of them. Um, and so 
I think that in Canada on the books and in terms of the criminal code provisions dealing with sexual assault and in particular consent, um, there have been some really, really successful uh, law reform efforts and some great statutory developments. And um, there's been lots of good writing on this, basically pointing out that the law of consent and sexual assault on the books actually looks pretty good. And we could view it as, you know, fairly successful. I, I wouldn't say that our work is done, but um, I think we can, can see that the provisions are pretty clear. Uh, they recognize um, that all the conditions, a non-exhaustive list of when consent is vitiated, the scope of the defense of mistaken belief in consent has been narrowed. The code imposes an obligation on those um, who are accused to give evidence of the reasonable steps they have taken to ensure the presence of consent if they're claiming a consent defense. So we now have what is described as an affirmative consent standard, and that is a very important thing, at least um, statutorily on the books. So that is a success from many years of feminist law reform and advocacy on the ground and receptive government policymakers. Um, and um, so let's keep in mind that pause before I devastate everyone. Not really, but um, I, I guess I want to move now to talk about some of the difficulties. So the statutory problems are largely um, successful. The law reform uh, project has been achieved in terms of consent, I think, but um, there are still major problems and huge gaps in how the system works. And I don't think it's an overstatement to say that the criminal justice system is largely a failed system. And whenever I say that, I always want to quickly clarify and say that there are incredible people working at every level of the institution, whether it's police, crowns, judges. Um, there, there's people valiantly trying to make the system work for survivors, and that that's fantastic. But overall, the system, I think, is um, a straining and a failed one. And so part of the work I'm interested in now is thinking about revisioning what would justice look like from a victim's perspective, and what actually, how do we think outside of the confines of the criminal justice system? Um, so, uh, statute and doctrine precludes certain problems from occurring in criminal uh, trials. So, for example, it's not supposed to be legitimate to say that the complainant was unchaste or failed to resist or didn't report promptly enough, and yet cross examination continues on all of these issues. Um, and the systemic difficulties are the most sharp and most um, virulently experienced by the most marginalized women and the most uh, vulnerable women. And those are racial, racialized women, sex workers, women with disabilities, women who are drunk or high. Um, and there's, there's lots of, of uh, great work documenting this. So there's a problem systemically in terms of criminal justice system processes. Um, and I think one thing to keep in mind that has been alluded to in some of the comments is that the entire criminal justice system is built around protecting the, right, the rights of the accused from the power of the state. That is the raison d'etre of the criminal justice system. And so it, by definition, despite the tinkering at the edges we do to make all kinds of important reforms, um, is not victim friendly. It is certainly not victim centered. It's not set up for that. Uh, a woman who is a complainant in a sexual assault case is a victim witness to a crime against the state. She's the object and not the subject of the legal proceedings. And I think that's something we still don't have a wide social understanding of. People think, you know, you just report and you'll get justice. Um, but I think there's a paradox right there in sort of that systemic and structural that's not really understood. And we know how many cases never reach the attention of the criminal justice system. And there's, and of those tiny fraction that do, the levels of attrition are extreme. So there's a massive filtering process. So this we need, to, we need to think about. So how do we reach survivors of sexual violence, given that the criminal justice system is really not the site for getting justice? Um, so I just want to sketch out what I see as some of the biggest and most profound uh, issues shaping sexual assault law in terms of how it's practiced, not on the books. Um, and that is the social context in which sexual assault occurs. And that is obviously, as has been discussed, um, gender inequality, hypersexualization of girls, beliefs about men's sexual entitlement. I'm ambivalent about the use of the term rape culture, but I think it has some currency and some efficacy. Um, there's a general social denial of gender inequality and a general um, disbelief about the prevalence and normalcy of sexual violence in women's lives. And as far as you mentioned, the outpouring that has recently happened in high-profile cases is a bit of a deja vu. Yes, there's been massive media attention, but these stories are not new. It's not the first time that we're hearing about it. 
there's a profound misunderstanding of the complex dynamics of power and accommodation and how those get negotiated sexually. There's a deep failure to understand the dynamics of trauma. I think we need a trauma-informed legal system. And women are still not considered to be reliable narrators of their experiences of sexual violence. This is what's referred to as the credibility problem. We have a culture of suspicion towards women and of disbelief. Uh, Rebecca Solnit, who's one of my new favorite writers, wrote a brilliant piece in Harper's last fall on silencing women. And she says, not uncommonly, when a woman says something that impugns a man, particularly a powerful one or an institution, especially if it has to do with sex, the response will question not just the facts of her assertion, but her capacity to speak and her right to do so. Generations of women have been told they are delusional, confused, manipulative, malicious, conspiratorial, congenitally dishonest, often all at once. And yet, we know that to, um, to heal from trauma, uh, to tell a story and have it recognized and respected is one of the best methods we have. So then how do we do this in the context of a failed system and in a culture of contempt for women and racism and contempt for powerlessness and the production of marginalization of so many people? So I had so much more to say, but I'll stop right there. <laughs> I don't know about anybody else, but I'm totally getting my nerd on. I'm so, like, everybody is just really brilliant on this panel. Um, and it's pretty exciting to hear just, I think, a topic that is so far-reaching. And our last speaker is um, Lisa Taylor, and she's the assistant um, professor at the Ryerson School of Journalism. And in the Ryerson, School of Univers in Ryerson University School of Journalism, Lisa Taylor works as the assistant professor. Throughout her career, she has focused on the intersection of law and journalism. She holds an LLB and an LLM from the Schulich School of Law to Housie University. Prior to attending law school, she spent a decade with CBC Radio, Television, Radio, Radio and Television in a wide range of journalistic roles. After attaining an LLB from Dalhousie Law School, Lisa returned to CBC, ultimately becoming a network justice and legal affairs specialist. Lisa left CBC in 2005 to practice law and to teach. She has previously lectured at the King's College of Journalism and Mount St. Vincent University, both in Halifax. Most recently, she returned to King's College as an adjunct professor in Dalhousie's Faculty of Graduate Studies to develop and teach a new course on digital mobile reporting tools as a part of King Masters of Journalism degree. <clears throat> Lisa is a former member of the National Board of Directors of LEAF, the Women's Legal Education Action Fund, and currently sits on, sits on the Canadian Centre for Court Technology. In oh, intel Action. I think it's a made-up word. <laughs> You're going to tell us more about that working group. Thank okay. you, Lisa. Welcome, Lisa. There is another way to frighten people at a party. It's saying, let me tell you about my master's thesis. <laughs> I have a captive audience, so let me tell you about my master's thesis. Actually, it's something that I was interested in as a very young journalist, and I continue to research and look at, and certainly the so-called watershed moments of the, past, of the past year are informing this. So um, what I was looking at was the ban that we know is regularly imposed in uh, sexual assault cases, and it's ostensibly to protect the victim from the media. But this law, actually can curtail freedom of expression because the ban is not just for the others. That ban is on the woman herself. So I've documented a range of cases that mostly fly beneath the radar, but I can show them to you, in which victims have had to jump through hoops to have the legal right to speak unfettered. Cases in which women have spent money and time, and cases in which women have been told that they should second guess what they want, that they by the people who care most about them, by, um, by, by judges, by lawyers, by their families, their faith leaders. They've been told, maybe you just don't want to do this. So it's well-intentioned, but it's paternalism nonetheless. Um, now, this ban clearly works for the vast majority of sexual assault victims. In fact, Ingrid Sochting in Vancouver, who studied this, says, overall, you know, after some time in recovery, there's still only about 25 or 30 percent of women who would like to speak publicly, like to own their story in that way. Um, but what, then we watch things like been raped, never reported. An amazing thing. But it was the mere fact that there was no criminal prosecution associated with it that made it legal to put your name and 140 characters in social media. Technically speaking, 
if we had another kind of groundswell that was on Twitter what, that was specifically about women talking about the deplorable experience they have in the criminal justice system, they would be violating the publication ban. Women don't get to tell their own lived experience. Now, the ban can silence women. Um, and, but nonetheless, many of the lawyers I know are really dismissive of the idea. I mean, I say, you can't, you know, it, it is kind of, it's constraining. And they'll say, really, though, come on, it's not as if a prosecutor would ever um, charge a woman with breaking her own ban. Um, but I think that really misses the point. Maybe someone doesn't want to break the law. Why should I have to take the chance that I may break, be considered to have broken the law? just by talking about my experience. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was having uh, lunch with two friends who were both uh, Bay Street lawyers, and one of them was so dismissive, he said, oh, Lisa, all she'd have to do is go and make an application to the court. <laughs> Thank you, exactly. I don't have to explain that, yes. Um, <laughs> The legal system is intimidating, it's expensive, it's time consuming, it takes resources that so many victims don't have. So for many, just making an application is not a realistic option. So in case anyone's worried, I am so not advocating for the end of this ban. What I'm calling for is greater rule flexibility and more robust support for women who do seek to exercise personal agency to ensure that sexual assault complainants have the freedom to speak publicly about their own lived experience. Now, in recent years, we have heard power... Excuse me one sec. And that's five seconds. Power will not give me back. <laughs> In recent years, we have heard powerful voices, women who've taken a public stand against their abusers. And in many cases, the perpetrators were powerful figures. There was a public radio host you may be familiar with, a well-respected anesthesiologist, an award-winning teacher renowned for his program to keep at-risk kids in school, and an RCMP officer, who later became a Reform Party MP, um, who was supposed to be maintaining law and order in northern communities and instead abused young women. Now, in the cases I've cataloged, I've found three common reasons why victims choose to self-identify, and they won't be surprising to you. It is to heal, to move from victim to survivor, to help and support others. I know of one indigenous woman who said she wanted to try to open up the culture of so many other indigenous people who were suffering in silence, and just to call attention to the systemic problems that we all in this room know so well. Now, if the public conversation with respect to sexual assault has changed, I think it is due, in some part, to these women. And if the trend continues, if, here's what we have to watch for. Here's what I'm most concerned about, okay? For the most part, the women we have seen speak out about this, speak publicly, are illustrative of society's ideal victim, as Melanie would know. They are articulate, white, able-bodied, professional women. So what happens if or when the victim who speaks up is more representative of who is most at risk? Yeah. Will our society be quite so quick to rally around and support a sexual assault victim who is disabled, who is homeless or in precarious housing, indigenous, transgendered, racialized, a newcomer to Canada, a sex trade worker? Will they receive the groundswell of support that we have seen in these high profile cases to date? This is my big concern. When society says, we believe all women, I hope society really does believe all women. Thank you. That was fantastic. And I think that really brings us to um, the question that I want to ask, which actually came from Melanie. Um, that question of when women come forward, that, that kind of pressure, when women disclose, so to a friend or to a teacher, and that, that answer they get back is, well, why didn't you report it? Or just go report it, it's easy. I wonder if the panelists could actually speak to some of the complexities that face reporting. Um, I know we're, I work in the Muslim community, and the NS case was something that was really hard in the community because it pretty much deemed a group of women as rapeable. A dreamed group of women, such as women that wear the niqab, that if they wanted to access justice, that there were so much barriers, then why would you go forward to a judge knowing that you may be told that you're not allowed to testify? And it takes so much. Or we know now with new, the new Bill S-7, the Barbaric Cultural Practices Act, which sounds like a national lampoon skit, 
but is a real name of a law, will create more barriers for Muslim women and other women from communities that are racialized to come forward about sexual violence that is happening in forced marriages. So we know this is happening in communities. We know this is happening with sex workers. We know this is happening with indigenous women. But I'd love us to talk more about what are the barriers that we're seeing and kind of getting away from the idea of it's just easy to report. So I don't know who wants to start, and it's okay if you don't. But any of our panelists want to take a, I was about to say stab, but we're in a violence against women's space. <laughs> I, yeah, I can, I can say a little bit to that, uh, Farah. Um, I think that, because it's one of the things I really struggle with, and, and particularly the backdrop of the recent high-profile cases that shall remain nameless at the moment. Um, you know, it, these weren't cases of he said, she said. These were he said, she said, she said, she said, times 30 in one case of, uh, of alleged victims. Um, and that's the other thing we have to call them as alleged um, as well. Um, and so I struggle because... You know, the, the dialogue is so dominant that what, there's a suspicion if you don't go forward and if you don't report that this is not real because you should be reporting, everyone should be reporting. And, um, and the, I think we don't look at the fact that there are some communities that are uh, more targeted and represented and not dealt with within the criminal system well. Um, and so there are communities that are afraid of coming forward just period for anything or that have, don't, don't have good relationships. For example, sex workers, there are many barriers for sex workers. They are extremely at risk for sexual violence, um, but they face some of the biggest barriers to reporting sexual violence. And so that's just one example in terms of some of the barriers. Um, that it, then they know that they might be faced with the kinds of questions that we heard this evening, like what were you doing, what were you wearing, why did you go back to that person's room, that because we live in a culture um, and their criminal system reflects this culture of, of rape myths and misinformation about sexual violence, that, that will be mirrored within those agents within the system. And I'm not saying that all agents are like that. There are some real good folks working that are, are fighting those myths, but I think... Um, we still hear these stories from survivors who do come forward, who do engage with the system, that they get asked those questions from the folks that are supposed to be supporting them. And then that's not to say what's going to happen with a defense lawyer. So I think why folks don't come forward is because they face barriers to being able to access police based on their own, own history or their community's history around um, uh, police engagement. And they also uh, hear from other survivors what their experience has been or they've read about what their experience is in and they hear how people talk about survivors. Like again, with these high profile cases, the kind of stuff that was being said on social media or at parties, like, oh, gold diggers, jilted girlfriends, like all of these rape myths are out there that they hear as survivors quietly in their heart. So I think the barriers are there because we create the barriers as a community. We are all complicit and those systems mirror and reflect those barriers. I wanted to add from a youth perspective as well, we have to think, like, who are these young people going to and, and confiding in to report to? So from a youth perspective, well, it's always called the police. Well, a lot of young people don't have a great relationship with the police in the first place. So that can be really traumatizing and scary to have to call someone that you feel that every time you see them, you're guilty and you have to run into the building or something. So there's that lack of trust for authority. Also, teachers aren't prepared, I think, to deal with the issues that young people go through. Specifically, I think young people are really desensitized. So when I speak to youth about, and we do workshops on anti-oppression, um, just confidence, beauty, sexual assault, a lot of things come up where young women think it's okay for a guy to grab my bum when I walk down the hall in school. So they're really desensitized to the fact that, oh yeah, my friend, um, they were in a hallway and she got raped by three guys. And and she's telling us this like it's nothing, like it's something that she saw on TV. And media, movies, has a lot to do with how young women feel about themselves. They feel there's a lot of shaming around youth culture. Well, it's her fault. What was she wearing? A lot of that kind of rhetoric comes into it. So young people don't have really peers that they can open up to or trust. Because my, if I tell my best friend, she may tell the school, and that's where the shaming comes in. Young people are making fun of her. The guy is the macho man, and the girl is like this evil slut. And, you know, she's shamed throughout the whole school in the community and everything. Shaming is a big issue. And I really feel that we have to approach this from a... Our community is very diverse. There's so much... Um, just culturally, a lot of young women are really scared to come out. And some parents really don't have 
they can't support them in those type of disclosures. So it's really important to look at people's backgrounds, um, their religious views, and how we can approach it from a manner where we can be very inclusive to all young people and create safe spaces where young people feel comfortable in coming and disclosing. And also teachers as well, or think of the, the people around these youth who affect them. So police, teachers, do they have that relationship with teachers? Are teachers prepared to really do something when they hear? Or is it really right to the police? Oh, we got to report to the, the counselor. So that could severely change a person's life, right? Just by taking those legal steps. Um, yeah, it's not easy. I'll just say it's really not easy to just disclose and for these things to happen. And also defining sexual assault and consent for young people. They really think that what they're going through is normal. It's okay for him to touch me here and there in the hall. It's just a joke, Wendy. Oh, miss, he's just doing this for fun. And young women don't really know that what is happening to them, this is sexual assault or this is dangerous. This is violent behavior. So really having these open conversations and defining things for them and creating safe ways that they can disclose and be supported once they do disclose these type of like really scary incidents that they're going through. Yeah. Um, I, I just want to say that we have a cultural preoccupation with focusing on the victim. I mean, that's one of the manifestations of victim blaming. So it's an obsession. It's a fixation. The lens is always on what did she do? And I think that for many women, um, there's so much ambivalence and self-doubt and self-blame about how a situation got navigated. And that's something that is very misunderstood in law, and that is going to be exacerbated a thousandfold in the criminal justice system, where, as I mentioned, she's the object of the inquiry, and she's giving evidence for the crime against the state. And so um, we have this assumption that women should just report, but undisturbed in that is this idea that the criminal justice system works and will actually deliver justice for victims. But is that actually the case? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. So I think that's something we need to talk about. So, and I think we need to shift the lens onto perpetrators. We have a, almost a, a, a silence on the question of perpetrators and asking the questions, you know, who are the men who uh, sexually violate, coerce, intimidate? And it's not just rape. The term rape is too narrow. And it's so, as you mentioned, the definitional issues are there as well. A lot of women have difficulty naming their own experiences because our images of what a rape or sexual assault looks like don't correspond to the everydayness of experiences of sexual violence, intimidation, coercion. There's a whole continuum there. So I think those are some of the issues that kind of need to be thought of in terms of deconstructing the question of why a woman didn't report or what are the barriers. I'd like to add something about what happens after a woman doesn't report. Um, it seems to me that not reporting to the police is the most rational and reasonable decision a woman can make. If uh, she looks at all of the possibilities, then she's smart not to report. But our uh, culture is, this is maybe the legal side of the rape culture, there's always the doubt. Maybe she didn't report because she really didn't get raped. Mm -hmm. Maybe she didn't report because she knows that it wouldn't stand up to um, inquisition. And so the woman who doesn't report is also blamed for not reporting. Yes. And so she lives in limbo. Yeah. And I think that some women report for altruistic reasons. They know it's going to be sheer hell, but as in the recent uh, radio host situation, some women came forward out of altruism. But I think some women are forced to come forward because they cannot stand living in that limbo where they are just as blamed for what happened. And they're pushed into the criminal justice system in order, more or less, to prove themselves. And that is really unfortunate. Can I just add to your point? Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. one quick thing. I wanted to add to that a lot of young people, just in the youth perspective, a lot of these young women, are the perpetrator lives within their community mm. or lives within the same building that they live in. So reporting becomes very complicated because they feel like, oh my gosh, he knows where I live. He knows where my brother lives. Mm -hmm. My younger siblings, they worry about their mother 
and what these men can do to them. So there's the power, power dynamics. So when they don't report, they really leave space for the ability to be re-victimized by these young gentlemen, by other men, and they can say mm -hmm. now, oh, well, she didn't say nothing. You know, you guys now, you have a turn with her, you try her. And mm -hmm. seriously, this is how sometimes they talk. So not disclosing opens doors to be re-victimized and to be in that space. Sorry, just yeah. made me think of that. Yeah. One of the things about a lot of the cases in which we've seen women speak publicly that I find really troubling is, and Lenore just touched on it, the idea of how many women's voices does it take to counter one man? Mm -hmm. How many? Yeah. Because the four cases that I have alluded to here, Tom Ellison in Vancouver, multiple complainants in that case. Jack Ramsey, multiple complainants. Gomeshi, clearly, do not, so many. And there was, in all the discussion around Gomeshi, the one thing that was said that I was, I, I just didn't even bother being anything other than rude, because it just pisses me off, if I can say that, can was pass. people saying, at, oh, at first I, I didn't really believe that story, but now that Lucy de Cotera has come out, and now that Riva Seth has come out, so in the whole idea of, you know, we believe all women, uh -huh. a wonderful phrase, can we, what's it going to take for us to say we believe one woman? <laughs> yeah. It's hard. And we believe ourselves. Like, I think oftentimes, too, women, when I work with women, oftentimes we internalize that message that somehow we don't have the right to be safe. That when someone hurts us, we say sorry. When we speak out, that somehow we brought it on ourselves because we internalize those messages. So it's, it's a really important piece also to unpack. When, when women actually say hateful things about other women, I sometimes think, what do you think about yourself? Like, what, have you, what message have you internalized? Um, I want to ask the panelists, okay, so we've talked about how the difficulties for survivors, our, what would we want to go going forward if we had the chance to make Canada a place where survivors were centered in the conversation about violence against women, and that we had a consent culture, what would that look like? What would be the key elements for in the media or how we actually work with survivors? How we center this around survivors instead of around perpetrators? I can speak really briefly to it because I, I see what Mary's saying. I agree. I don't know if the criminal justice system we have right now is the place um, a sexual assault victim should be, but the thing that could at least, it can't level the playing field, but it can start to mitigate, is seeing independent counsel appointed, state counsel, for victims in sexual assault cases. That's a small start, but it's a start. Yeah, I agree. Anyone else? Well, one of the possibilities is um, the civil action rather than criminal uh, court because the, um, the rules are a bit different and the uh, defendant uh, counsel would not have the uh, total leeway that the defendant counsel now has for um, a slicing and dicing the uh, um, survivor. So that's a possibility. And I think in, in um, indigenous societies um, where uh, it's possible to identify the assailant and where it's possible to affix an indigenous identity to the assailant, it may be that indigenous uh, processes would be preferable to becoming involved with state processes because even more so than in other cases, we have clearly seen both police and judges victimizing indigenous girls. Mm -hmm. Can I just jump in on one thing? Not to be a downer about the civil actions. Thank you, <laughs> because I was going to jump in about that one. I mean, one, I so. think that they can be, um, they can be successful, and it, we should use any tool or power within the legal system we can. So I think civil actions, there's some research on it as more therapeutic and lots of good things about it. But, Although there's not the same level of interrogation as there is in the criminal justice system, there's usually um, a, a really pathologizing, hostile, damages sideshow where expert evidence is commissioned and women's um, lives are absolutely brutalized. So I think it just gets replicated in a different form, and I don't know what the solution to that is, but um, I've just been reading some reports in different cases, and it, it's just, just as ugly. So, Well, I think... Um I made the suggestion about the civil action faux de mieux because, uh, you know, increasingly I, don't, I think that the whole of the legal system is kind yeah. of a no-go zone. For, and uh, we, just as, uh, 
you know, uh, feminist scholars and activists put together the Women's Court of Canada to rewrite uh, terrible judgments uh, and make them the way they were supposed to be. Maybe we need different um, sort of ad hoc civil society organizations to deal with this issue and just, you know, forget the organized uh, criminal law system. I don't call it a criminal justice system when I can help it because it's not a justice system at all. Like an injustice system. <laughs> Does anybody else want to? Well, while you guys are fighting with the law, we'll be fighting in the schools. And I think my approach would be we really need to get Metrac in every school in Toronto. That would be amazing. And really do workshops starting from a very young age about um, just oppression, looking at uh, anti-racist frameworks, anti-oppressive frameworks, looking at what confidence and healthy relationships look like. I think just growing up as a young person, we were never taught what a healthy relationship is or how to get along with ourselves, with other human beings. We don't really learn a lot about who we are in school and deal with a lot of these kind of microaggressions that everyone or every, every bi everyone has their own bias. So I think that young people need to work through that and learn to define uh, what they're going through. Uh, so I think education is an important piece from a young age. That way we're not dealing with these issues when they're adults because a lot of these perpetrators are adults who have power and should be able to think and make conscious decisions, but they're not. So something is really, there's a disconnect with the educational system and really uh, treating young people from a young age and showing them that this is wrong, that treating women this way is wrong. So I'm fighting for the education system to transform, but you see how that's <laughs> going already with what said, so I'm sure it'll be a lifelong fight uh, for me and Metrac as well <laughs> to start some change, right? Lenore, did you want to add? I think my distinguished colleagues have said many good things. I, I mean, I just want transformation generally um, because honestly, until we change all the systems that support sexual violence, uh, uh, we're gonna still need to have sexual assault centers in our community. I want um, amazing prevention education campaigns. I want amazing supports for survivors after the fact. I want um, amazing education in the schools from kindergarten talking about um, power and consent and and uh, boundaries and all sorts of cool things so that we and and how do you and do role playing and how do you actually negotiate consent I want to watch one movie where someone negotiates consent like think of it when have you actually seen a TV show or movie where anyone is checking it out before they get busy they're not and we don't teach kids how to do this yes. so to me I want like a massive transformation yes I want a legal I want a legal appointed person in the, the court system like I, I mean I could spend the next hour just telling you all the things I want to see but I think um, we all play a part in that everyone in the room we all can end this by the things that we do and don't do thank you so on that we're gonna open up the questions to um, online and to the people in this room we ask you that you ask questions um, um, please ask questions I know sometimes we want to make longer statements but I will gently ask you to <laughs> ask a question um, so, please, there's two microphones here, so take up, just walk up to the microphone. Yeah, don't be shy. There you go. Uh, is it on? All right, I've got a question, mainly from a, a legal perspective. I'm a lawyer, I'm in my second year, and I don't do work in the criminal system anymore. I'm mostly civil, but I understand completely this kind of false discourse of innocence when it comes to the perpetrator and the way it's set up. A lot of my friends that are doing their PhDs and everything, I always come to the question when, when they're talking about it, I tell them, okay, but how? Okay, you have a problem with all of these structures and all of these oppressive frameworks. How do you fix it? I, as a lawyer, maybe just being practical-minded, I really, I always want to know how, okay, how are we getting from A to B? With the criminal justice system, it's actually the first time I've heard this suggestion of an independent prosecutor kind of thing, but what are the other suggestions, kind of substantive, what would you suggest if we were to take away this kind of idea of innocent until proven guilty, which is just kind of foundational to the criminal justice system? Could you elaborate? Melanie will answer that question. <laughs> I think the idea of legal representation for victim witnesses is a great idea. It's essential, and I think that would slightly help shift things a bit, as well as much more support for um, like victim witness programs as well. They're 
I think, a flood of demand and not enough uh, support and resources. I think there's been some really, really great work uh, done on what does it actually mean to do ethical lawyering as a defense. And I think that work is really only just being um, started in that conversation. And how can we engage professional ethics to prohibit um, all of the kind of bad behavior we see in criminal trials and um, not to kind of use all the ways that women's credibility is attacked and not to um, explicitly or implicitly use kind of misogynist or racist or, you know, tropes. So I, I think there are ways. I don't know if it's more than tinkering at the edges, but I think those things are important in individual cases. And I think it's a good question because I don't think we need to throw out the criminal justice system. Exactly. It's really important and it sometimes works. There are some people who go through it and actually feel vindicated or sense of relief. So we have to not lose sight of that. The system does sometimes work. I think it's the minority of cases, but still. And um, I think there's lots of scope for people within their institutional context. There's some amazing judges doing incredible work. There's amazing police officers. There's great crowns. And I think there's some defense as well who are trying to think this through. So I think within all of our context, we need to think about how can we do this better. I, I hope that's sort of a beginning end. No, it, it definitely does. Those are some ideas that I, I wouldn't even have thought of. But, so that's excellent. Thank you very much. I don't think that we really can shed the presumption of innocence. It is foundational. Yeah. And there are already too many people being wrongly convicted. We can't have a legal system without the presumption of innocence. But this is one area, the sexual violence area, is one where the presumption of innocence, incredibly valuable as it is, uh, works a dreadful hardship on the victims of crime. It's so privatized, right? It's so. I like the idea of uh, trying to find more um, ethical ways for a defense counsel to do their business. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's, um, you know, the law society is very interested in um, civility, but uh, civility does not touch what happens right. in a criminal, uh, a sexual assault defense. We are way beyond issues of whether the lawyers are being civil. And so this is something that is um, you know, a, a huge problem for legal ethics. Also, just to think more expansively, what would justice look like from the victim's perspective? It's a huge question. So to actually mm. think together from all of our contexts, what would it look like? And also, I think quite a radical idea in terms of rethinking is, what would seriously taking um, mutuality and equality as the legal standard for consent look like? Like, how would that actually shift substantively how things are done? I also sorry, wanted to add, I would really love to see dedicated crowns in community, sexual assault crowns with much more expertise than just the training that they get now. I'd love to see judges better trained around these issues because they seem to be impenetrable in terms of um, the training. And um, I think that would help a lot uh, in terms of helping victims within those systems. Hi. Yes, I thought uh, Wendy put her finger on a very important problem when she said that uh, young people are desensitized to what um, it is reasonable for them to expect and what isn't reasonable for them to expect. And they're judging um, that reasonableness by film and television uh, and what we've been defining here today as the rape culture, um, which leads me to focus on um, uh, pornography, mm -hmm. which is one of the biggest issues today, I think, that's creating uh, rape culture. Uh, it's apparently extremely popular and extremely um, uncensored and uncontrolled. And I mm -hmm. think it's part of what's changing the culture uh, in our society. Um, now, to take a, a, a considerable leap, because we're talking here today about what can the legal system do and what can't it do, uh, it was recently brought to my attention that the criminal code uh, has been changed to take effect on March the 10th that um, uh, uh, crimes against uh, a group, including uh, groups defined by sex, uh, can be considered a hate crime. That while the hate crime provisions of the criminal code came in in the early 1970s, they did not apply to sex and they will now do so. And what I wanted to suggest is that it gives us a great deal to think about as to how this new section of the criminal code can be used 
to deal with uh, issues about sexual uh, violence uh, against women, uh, pornography that's causing this desensitization. I had my own theory. I'm about, just going to... Uh, I'm just going to ask you to give us a question. Well, a question. Mm -hmm. Of course, you're absolutely right. The question <laughs> is, given that background, uh, do you think uh, that the hate crime provisions of the criminal code coming in just now can be used to solve some of the problems you've been talking about today? Thank you. I'll leave it to the legal okay, experts. Uh, I can't speak to it. Um, I'll take a flyer on that and say no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, um, not, not that I have a close knowledge of pornography, but uh, I did at one point serve on the Fraser Committee on Pornography and Prostitution, and it seems to me that a lot of the pornography uh, then and today uh, doesn't reach the levels of perfidy that... Uh, is required to uh, attract the operation of a hate crime uh, criminal code provision. And so I think it might be useful in some situations, but it's not a, it's not a, a, a kind of a readily available go-to solution. <laughs> well, I think of something that I might be arrested under C-51 if I said it. <laughs> one, one thing to know that I think is really neat that's happening in the States um, in some schools is they're actually doing porn literacy. And people can, you know, you can make a flinch, but we have to do harm reduction models and actually have real conversations with everybody, but especially young people who are accessing porn. Because, listen, my brother is a... He's going to be so angry, but it's okay. Oh, no. I have four, so who knows? Brother. Um, but, you know, like, I remember walking in his room, and he was watching porn. He was like, I'm not watching anything. I'm watching Britney Spears. And I was like, uh-huh. But, but here's the thing. He's a great kid. But so I had to have a conversation about him, about how porn is made. And, like, you know, this isn't, this isn't actually what really is happening when you have sex. And he was young. And so I would ask is that instead of going to a place of just saying porn is bad, and I think as feminists we can have a long conversation about that later, but I do think that there's really interesting work being happening around porn literacy and actually having conversations with young people, with parents, being like, how do you talk to your kids about porn? Because instead of saying to kids, don't watch it, because guess what, they'll do it and not tell you about it on their phone, mm -hmm. in the house while they're having dinner with you, or anywhere <laughs> else because they're doing it, it's better to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, first of all, this is an amazing experience to come to the Law Society um, for an event and people are talking about rape culture and unapologetically um, and just the level of advocacy is incredible today. So I want to say thank you and I'm really glad I'm here. But um, my question is about my male, I wouldn't say all male, but many of my male colleagues that aren't in the room, that wouldn't come to a room like this, that are unapologetic about their misogyny and about even when it comes to the law, if they're having discussions about the law. And I think that, um, like, how does feminism turn into something beyond an interest or something fringe or something that alienates you from other people? Like, how do we make them a part of the conversation professionally? Yes, yes. Mm. I feel that is so important. And thank you, sister, for bringing that up. Because a lot of times as women, when we talk about women's issues, we label men as the perpetrator and the pe uh, predator. But we need to look at men as allies. And what is really, what are these external factors that are turning men to do certain behaviors that we find as women unacceptable? Um, so what I would say, just working with some young people, We've had co-ed groups before, and sometimes the, the young boys feel a little timid in, in really being open. And we're, Metrac is really adamant in creating safe spaces for young people to feel safe and, and open to share their opinion. And we have young men, once you do that and you allow men to really air out how they truly feel, you'll hear comments like, you know, but miss, you know, she deserved it because she was wearing a short skirt. And me, most women will cringe when they hear this, but I'm like, yes, I want to rise to the occasion because I feel it's an opportunity for learning. Let's really give men the space to be honest about how they see women or how they feel that, you know, things are happening in their world. And let's deconstruct that. Let's unpack that. Let men be honest about how they see us. And then let's talk about it instead of yelling at him and saying, you know what, young man, that was wrong. And that's rude to say that. No, as a facilitator, we take charge and we say, you know what? 
let's talk about this. You know, let's make it related to young men. So once I was able to say, well, sir, you know, you're wearing a hoodie here, right? What if a police officer looked at you and he judged you based on your hoodie and said, you're a thug because you're wearing a hoodie. Just like you're calling me a slut because I wear a short skirt, <laughs> right? Once you flip the script for men and allow them to really relate and see how it applies to their life, they're like, oh my God, no, miss, that's so wrong. He can't do, I'm not a thug because I wear a hoodie, it's just a hoodie. And they had this like, ta-da moment in their mind. So really allowing space for young men to be open, giving um, qualified people need to really unpack that and letting men really realize how this affects them, how it relates to them. But what if they're like 35 years old? Oh, girl, and that's not working, <laughs> and you're having an argument. <laughs> that's another like problem. Nine. Yeah, yeah, you, know? you can't teach a dog new tricks, but I'll leave it for you guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, that's a, those are really excellent things, and uh, I I agree. There are some great campaigns, and there are some folks doing some really good work. And you're right, we are mostly. Many of the campaigns are focusing on high school age and younger men. Mm. Like, and I know White Ribbon Campaign, Men Can Stop Rape. There's like even some cool hashtag activity on Twitter around men getting involved in stopping violence against women. Like there is a lot of way. I think I agree with what Wendy's saying. Having a space for men to unpack their gender socialization. Like what's the gender box you were shoved into? Yes. And what are the repercussions for you as a man about all this crazy stuff that you have to follow because you're a man and all the gender binary and you're this manly man and what does that mean? Mm. And I I think that when we help men get to that place to, to recognize how the patriarchy sucks for everybody, yeah. um, you know, I know that men have more benefit from that as a group, but there is a lot of variation when you look at uh, men, you know, maybe who are indigenous or, or experience racism. Like, there's a lot of places of where we can intersect and support each other and say, let's just fix all this mess, but you can be my ally as opposed to saying feminists are bad. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I know that's an incredibly nuanced conversation and not around the water cooler, but I think there is a way for for us to be able to look at how men are constricted as well. I just mm -hmm. want to say one thing, and that is just to bring the discussion back to power, because I think that kind of resistance is a very serious problem. You've raised a really, really important issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that right not to know is an exercise of power. And it's done all the time by members of dominant groups who don't want to hear about the problems of other groups. Yeah. And so I think there's a range of creative ways to address it, but I think understanding it in those frames is maybe one starting point. Um, and there are a lot of men, I'm encouraged by this, who are doing incredible work with other men, particularly with young men, who are doing very radical gender equality-based work on violence prevention and on actually reconstructing masculinity in a way that is not predicated on dominance and misogyny and racism. So um, there's some great work being done in that area. But it's a really big, huge question. <laughs> Thank you. And I think, too, like thinking about just going beyond the gender binary, too. So people that are trans or gender nonconforming or mm. butch women yeah. or queer folks, like there is conversations happening in communities, too, that are really challenging also how gender is performed, right? Because gender is performative. And so really, really thinking about that and unpacking that. Because I think, you know, Rosie DeMano, um, a couple years ago, wrote an article about a, a young man who came forward about being sexually assaulted in the club district. And she said it was every man's fantasy because he was raped by three women. And so here's a guy who comes forward about being sexually assaulted, and this is what he gets back. So we need to also think about when we talk about male victims as well and the way in which we approach those stories and the way in which we kind of silence those stories. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Benita, and I have a question. I mainly directed at Anuth. Um, you spoke a lot about how uh, women, uh, sorry, how we don't need to necessarily be experts uh, in the field in order to have something valid to say. And as someone who has attempted to and has successfully been able to um, design and um, you know facilitate workshops with high school and university students about sexual consent, self empowerment, things like that, I can say that it was an extremely difficult process to get the support to rally behind my, you know, with the massive bureaucracy trying to get um, you know institutions to believe that I had something valid to say and I'm wondering um, what how you conceive of how young people young men and women can find that platform to have that voice in a supportive environment because if you think about uh, you mentioned social media and a lot of people I've even noticed if I, if I publish something on Facebook that says something about oh you know gender equality or anything of that nature it b barely gets any likes but yeah. and you know you put a selfie up and everybody's like oh my god hundred likes amazing. right yeah so how do you um for young people who especially in high school who don't have maybe who aren't as ready yet to, to come out and just give a talk how do they find that the right group of people to do that in the safe space yet also um, being able to touch people that maybe 
might need to hear that what they have to say, but wouldn't be as willing to come to it forth to the table initially. Mm. That's amazing. Thank you so much for all the hard work that you're doing with facilitating these type of discussions with high school, you said, and university. Wow, it's, it's really hard dealing with the politics. It's not a sexy thing to want to talk about uh, sexual assault. I don't think every dean or principal wants to address or create a curriculum or support that, but really, this is, this is a trick too you have to do. So you have to show to them how this will benefit them, and that's how we work. Um, I have the opportunity because I, I get to ride under Medtrack's amazing name. They have great credibility. So we can go into the schools and we see certain problems and we want to kind of expand the program or tailor it to some of the issues we feel the young women are going through. We try to sell it to the principal or the VP as something that will really benefit the young people and how it will benefit her. We'll miss less fights. Don't you hate dealing with all those after school fights? So many girls are fighting each other. Why? We need to maybe talk about healthy relationship amongst women. So I try to sell it from that uh, point of view. I think making it really cool for young people to really get along. I feel you, girl. I put up the, the, the posts, the conscious posts. No one gives me a like. And I put that one little selfie on, and everyone's commenting. And it really annoys me, right? Because it shows how our culture is so about like aesthetics and beauty and, and the outer. And no one really cares about our behavior and who we are. So just really do your best to connect to the young people and make it for lack of a better word, sexy. You know, we got to make it hot. We got to make it relatable to the young girls. So how I, how I do that with my young people is I try to see, we really have to work. Young people have different triggers and influences. And I think you have to really know your demographic, know the young people you're working with. What may work with a group of young Muslim women may not work with a group of, you know, Afro-Caribbean or East African young women. So I have to be very conscious and in tune with my young people and play on their needs and their desires. And I try to be that you know, cool, awesome, smart, hip girl. You, know, you can be smart, and you can find, you know, fight against sexual assault, and you can still go to the club and have a margarita. You know, we can do it all as women. So I try to sell that to them, that you don't have to give up being cool to put a few posters of, of, of conscious things on your, your Facebook. So I guess it's just really relating with your demographic. And that's hard, but only you can do that as a facilitator. So that's on your job, girl. And you know, that just shows how amazing you are as a facilitator. So good luck to you. And if you want some tips, we can talk after. Thank you. <laughs> and I'll give you a little more insight. But thank you so much for the work you do. Hi, uh, my name's Rebecca. And my question is on credibility. Uh, I'll I know this is, I want to get right to the question, but I just want to let you know, I don't prosecute in the criminal courts. I prosecute on behalf of reg regulatory colleges. So I'm before administrative tribunals doing disciplinary hearings. And I had a sexual abuse case with a health college. Um, the victim was drunk. Uh, she was, English was her second language, wasn't highly educated. Um, and before the case, defense counsel told me I needed to withdraw it because no one's going to believe that a good girl gets that drunk. So this was defense counsel telling me this. For real. Um, we proceeded. We were successful. But I found it so frustrating that the usual factors we use to present to a panel or a judge as to what defines credibility. Um, a lot of victims aren't highly educated. A lot of victims are nervous and they might forget things. A lot of victims, uh, uh, English is a second language. Um, a lot of victims are under anesthesia or perhaps drunk. Um, basically... It creates a perfect victim. Um, is there any trending, is there any uh, thought given to how these sort of victims in these sort of situations, how their credibility should be assessed as opposed to the you know, perfect straw man credibility test that we usually proffer? There's a critical thinking miss so often in that situation that you're describing where someone says, no, who could ever believe her? But it has to be turned around and pointed out that all the things that you think make her not credible based on the old school yardstick we've been using are the very reason she was preyed upon in the first place. It Those are the conditions of her so vulnerability. Yeah, it seems yeah. so self-evident. Yeah. Um, uh, popular culture hasn't done much. It's shown us that um, only pretty blonde cheerleaders get sexually assaulted. That's what the movies show us. They don't give us a representation of who is most vulnerable. So those who are least likely to be believed are just easy targets. I'd, I'd also like to uh, mention a couple of things. One is, um, at one stage in my uh, legal work, 
I, I represented uh, interveners who had been allowed to uh, participate in regulatory hearings, both at the Law Society and at some of the health colleges. And uh, we had usually good relationships with the prosecuting counsel. And one of the things that we did was um, look for ways of assisting uh, with that uh, credibility issue. And um, in some cases, uh, physical evidence will do it. I can remember in one case, there, the, the, um, the complainant was talking about being somewhere and then being at home and somebody having followed her home. And the assumption was on the part of the prosecuting counsel that the person could never have got from where he encountered the woman to her home. And that was just based on ignorance of the geography of the city. And so we drove it. And we drove it in all kinds of different ways. And we found a way that he could have not just got there, he could have been there first. And so in that helpful way, we assisted with her credibility, not by introducing a different standard, but by actually believing her and looking for other kinds of evidence that would believe her. And I'm a big believer in physical evidence. You know, I've gone and, you know, tromped around fields and looking for, you know, trees that were cut down and all kinds of stuff like that. It's, it's just an example, but it, it's worth looking into. Thank you. Can I, I, we have a question from um, our online, we have people online also, and so I'm just gonna, I know, I know. Um, but just to add to that, could you, could they wanted to ask a question, um, this is Rachel White, and she said, what are the issues surrounding the use of the victim's therapy notes and diaries um, in a criminal legal pr process? What are the issues? The yeah. Oh. Look at you. Oh. <laughs> oh. Wow, where do wow. you start? Don't worry. Where do you start? Do you want to start? No, go for no. it. Well, I mean, okay, it's... Okay, a lot of us have feelings about it. I'm, yes. I'm feeling the room. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, th I think it's, uh, it's re-victimization. And often it does not have any useful evidentiary purpose. Yeah. And I'm going to jump from there to a recent hearing where... I mean, and this, this kind of victimization happens at all levels. And I give you an example of the Justice Lori Douglas case where she was being prosecuted by the Judicial Council uh, in a hearing about whether she was fit to continue on the bench. And they kept wanting, in panel after panel, despite legal challenges, they kept wanting to show the panel the photographs of her that were taken by her husband. What possible probative value would they have? It was an intimidation technique, pure and simple, not to mention you know, with a little side dish of purians. Yep. And so those therapy notes should be subject, I think, to an unqualified privilege. <laughs> Thank you. Whether they're done by doctors or social workers or whatever, they should just be protected. Yeah, I like I know certainly from our perspective in, the, in our center, uh, our um, counseling team writes notes so that Bit, so brief and so minimal that sometimes they struggle to find any usefulness about them. And that's what we do because we're so concerned about that issue of our notes getting. And so I think what that means is that folks who are in the know who are doing therapy notes are basically doing no notes or brief, minimal, just what you have to put down things. Um, and then that's not also useful, but I agree. It's, it's such a problematic concern around the whole issue of her notes. I've worked in criminal justice for close to 40 years from many perspectives, and I have two comments with a question. <laughs> One is to wonder, really, um, what even in the best outcome of a sexual assault trial where the complainant's testimony is entirely accepted and a conviction is registered, what the benefit, what the outcome is that is really justice. And Picking up on what both Mary and Melanie have been saying, commenting on the shortcomings of our justice system, both from a criminal and a civil perspective, I have to wonder, and this is what I would really ask your opinions on, what would be a process that would bring justice in a really broad way to victims of sexual violence? Wow, great question. I'd, I'm going to start with the D word, 
because I still think that convictions in this area have an important impact in deterrence. Right now, people commit sexual violence with a feeling of almost total impunity. And if we started registering some convictions, that sense of impunity would start to be eroded, and that can only be for the good. Now, where we go from there, I don't know. In a perfect world, I would love to see um, uh, prosecutions for bystanders. I mean, if you're, <laughs> what, it's the campaign of the week, isn't it? Have you yes. seen Who Will You Help? Yes, <laughs> yeah. a great show. Yeah, it is. If you've not seen it, you have to look at Who Will You Help? But the idea of if, you know, if you look at something like Retea Parsons, I would suggest that yeah. every person who looked at that photo or those photos and did nothing was complicit in that assault. Mm -hmm. So chasing down bystanders and making people realize that we all have to do something about this. Mm. I, I would... Uh, I would disagree, I think, in that I'm concerned. Like, well, I think we have to have, um, it's right now, it's an impunity, it is impunity. People are getting away with things and believing it's okay. Um, I'm just not sure that the system, like, because I'm thinking, if you go to jail, is that where you're going to unlearn rape culture? Big question mark there. Mm. Um, in terms of our, our correctional system, I have real questions on the therapeutic value and the culture that is happening within those. So I'm not sure I want to send more people there and bystanders. So I think I'm worried about the prosecute more people, get more people to jail stuff. Like I think there needs to be alternative measures culturally because there are many, many uh, folks amongst us uh, walking in our communities who engage in sexual violence. We know them. They're our neighbors, friends, family members. It's really sad and scary. But we have to do something culturally, I think, to deal with this issue as well and not like, have jails and courts solve it. I think that's a piece of the puzzle that's very important. But I don't believe that should be our only tool. And that's always a worry for me. I would just want to say in terms of the first part of the question that when the system does work, the criminal justice system, um, I don't know that I would say it's therapeutic. I think that would be an overstatement, but I think that there is some literature and we probably know some people who have gone through the system who um, feel that the effects have been fairly profound around validation and recognition and recognition of the harms and the wrong and there's something about the, the social condemnation. And I think that's really, really important. I wouldn't want to lose sight of that. So I think that's an example, as you said, if it works, if the woman's not excoriated and she's not vicious, you know, all that kind of stuff. Those are very, very important parts of what justice can be. I think it's rare that they're realized, but theoretically they're there and sometimes they, they do exist. Um, and I like the question you asked, the more broad question, and I agree as well about challenging the culture of impunity, but the bigger question is like, what, what would justice look like? And there's beginning to be, a, I think, a fairly rich but not yet fully engaged feminist literature on thinking through different models of justice that can coexist with or parallel or intersect with the criminal justice system and sometimes are outside of it, that are actually victim-led, that are thought through from the position of people who have expertise in gendered violence, that take accountability really seriously and think about accountability and what actually do offenders have to do to recognize the harms that they've perpetrated and actually uh, make amends and do repairs because I don't think our prisons come anywhere close to doing anything like that. So if we take rehabilitation seriously, we are failing hugely through the criminal justice system. So it's a really great question and I hope we can have more conversations about how to start thinking about answering that question. I will do two plugs there. There is an amazing conference happening at the end of this month called The Color of Violence 4. Mm -hmm. It's happening in Chicago. Um, I'm going, so you should go. But um, it's about actually what, how do we look at beyond state solutions? So how do we look beyond the criminal justice system as the only solution to addressing this? Um, and there's amazing group uh, work being done, like Generation 5 in San Francisco mm -hmm. that are looking at, in five generations, how do we end sexual violence and actually using labor strategies to, to actually talk about this or other community accountability models. So we are eight minutes until we have to finish, and there's four of you. We can do it. We can do so it. So what I'm going to ask is if you can all ask your question very quickly with no context to it, just <laughs> ask your question, and then we're going to do closing statements, all of us one minute, and we're going to get this done. Okay. Hi, my name is Julie. Way. I just want to ask a quick question because uh, it seems the, the, the consensus says there's the issues with the criminal justice system. No mention tonight has been made of the Ontario Human Rights Code and its um, impact on sexual harassment. And because the code is non-punitive, it seeks to help the, um, the victims in addressing the effects. 
Would you see this as an effective uh, remedy? And is the code prom problematic in, in any way for victims seeking to bring a sexual harassment claim, which is under the umbrella of sexual violence? Thank you. Do you want to go? Oh, look how supportive you all are. Yay. No, put the mic on. No. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Yep. I'm a Baptist pastor. Nobody talks to me at dinners. I don't even get invited anymore. Oh. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry. What are your suggestions on how to make our city safer? We've heard tonight creating safe places, creating safe places for disclosure, violence prevention. Um, the TTC has designated waiting areas. Drivers will drop off um, women in particular closer to their home. What suggestions do you have? that we can actually make our city safe. I'm also a mom. My kid's going to start school in September. Not to debate the curriculum, but yeah. I do not want my little girl using a bathroom if a boy can come in and use it as well. That's not safe f for me. Mm. So what are your suggestions on how we keep our kids safe in school and our city safe? Thank you. Great question. My name is Vivian Salmon. Um, my question is very quick. <laughs> Seems to me whether women hold it inside or whether they report it through the civil or criminal system, it seems to me that at the end of the day, women have to heal from the experience. So I'll just leave it with that. How do, how do women heal from this experience? So we all have These are one. such simple, quick questions. I know. <laughs> wow. We're gonna all an and we're going to all answer them in one minute. <laughs> all four? No, whatever you want to answer. Okay. These are all like master's thesis. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll kick it off in one minute about how, how women can heal and how any survivors, men and women, can heal. My experience in working with survivors, both individually and also systemically around policy issues, is that every healing journey is different. Some folks heal by doing work on their own, talking with friends and family. Some enter into counseling. Um, some talk to their faith leader, it's it, really the journey is different for folks. I just know that healing is possible. I want, if the, for the survivors in the room and out there, I want survivors to hear um, that there are folks that will believe you and will non-judgmentally -judge support you and keep looking until you find them because often the first person you talk to or the first people you talk to will not be that, sadly. Mm. Um, but everyone in the room is now going to not do that. So um, their healing is possible. There is hope for survivors. Um, but the journey is different. And unfortunately, it's not um, for many, a quick journey. So we have to stop doing the thing where, why isn't she over this yet? Um, and really support survivors. Thank you, Lenore. That's perfect. I think one of the important things to remember is that we must engage. And that is, we can't just hope that somebody's uh, violation will go away. We can't just say, as uh, I heard someone once say, oh, I don't want to pay attention to her now while she's all weepy. Let's have a party for her when she gets herself straightened up and graduates from university. Mm -hmm. No, we must engage now. And uh, the other thing I want to say is that just as there is a rape culture, we must cultivate a culture of resistance to rape, whether it is pushed back in a really hard way or whether it's one of those persuasive kinds of pushback, there is no place for bystanders. You're either resisting it or mm -hmm. you're a part of it. Mm. Absolutely. Wonderful. I'd like to add, um, for the safe spaces, I can't see your face, but I want, yes, Pastor. Um, I want to direct that. I feel that creating safe spaces really has to start with that resistance. And to me, the resistance, I know you're not happy about the, the curriculum, but we have to start having some type of conversation with these young people at a young age. They're distracted by iPhone, um, you know, hip hop, music, fashion, and unfortunately, you know, law and these type of issues can be very dry and boring for young people. I'm sorry, I had to say it, guys. <laughs> it's really dry. So we're competing with 
iPhone, we're competing with music and fashion. We really, when I say we have to make it sexy, we have to market this and package it in a way that young people will be able to ingest it and take it in and really understand what we're trying to teach them and not make it this just boring kind of writing on the chalkboard, but really engaging young people from a small age and that way they can resist. It's easier for us to teach young people than for me to go to the adult grown 40 year old man who's so much in his backpack that he's carrying. It's so much easier to create safety through young people and teaching them from a young age. Also creating safe spaces. Medtrack is working on creating um, basically like a safety uh, coalition, really getting people from uh, the government, police, young people really involved in talking about safety. Whoops, was that me? That's me. Oh, sorry. Me this so, time. <laughs> having like a safety committee and having different voices and continuing this intergenerational dialogue and not really having adults telling us what we should do to be safe, but really involving us in the conversation, involving disabled people, involving trans youth, uh, marginalized, racialized youth, so getting people on board in that conversation. I never did this to you, so first time, first time. But yeah, that's what I would say for safety. It's not easy to answer it uh, so quickly, but what I would like to add is, Girl, oh, sorry, sorry. I'm happy that parents are now <laughs> protesting and are involved in the educational system. Too many parents drop their kids off at school and go to work and don't care. So I'm glad that this is happening to make you open your eyes and see that you need to be involved in what your kids are learning. If you don't think it's okay, then talk about it. We need more dialogue. But the, the point is that people are standing up and now we can have these conversations. I spend a lot of my time with 18 to 22 year olds and I'm always curious to know what they learn. And I asked uh, recently, you know, how many of you women had some conversation with your parents or conversations around consent and probably 80%. I asked the young men, none of them, none of them. Mm -hmm. So I'm usually not a glass half full person and there's not much to be optimistic about, but I do finally believe that, I mean, I'm raising a, a boy, he will be a man. Mm -hmm. And I believe that this generation of parents, please God, will talk to the, not just their girls, it's not protect yourself, mm -hmm. it's you, young man, it's your responsibility to be part of a good society. And I think the work that Wendy does and others who work uh, with high school and university students are doing something really important because at some point we need our boys to know that condoning or turning a blind eye, let alone actually being a perpetrator, is just so wrong and that conversation isn't being had yet. These are such huge questions, and oh, sorry. <laughs> and um, I think really they're asking, you know, how do we make the revolution? I mean, yeah. so there you go. how to answer them in a short, <laughs> pithy way without lapsing into rhetoric is a big challenge. Um, in terms of the question about human rights, I think we should use any and all legal tools and forums that we possibly can to get any remedies that might make a difference. Um, I teach human rights law, so I'm a bit ambivalent, but I still think if there's some hope there, let's, let's use it. Um, I think in terms of healing, one thing we're not very comfortable, most of us individually doing, as well as as a culture, is sitting with people's pain and bearing witness to it. I think that's a very, very important part of healing, and I think that's something the legal system is not familiar with at all. Um, and that goes to sort of thinking through, and there's a lot of great work being done on this, a big conversation about what is a trauma-informed system look like that's psychologically literate and that understands inequality and power. Um, I agree about engagement and resistance. I actually wrote my PhD thesis on resistance. I think it's an incredibly important thing. And I guess about creating, this is huge and it sounds rhetorical, but what does it actually look like to have a culture of equality and not just equality, but inclusion? Mm. Oh. I have to say that um, this is a powerful panel. And I don't know, I want to research half the topics that were talked here. Um, and also take a moment to thank everybody here for taking, taking the time to really, I think the word resistance, right? That we are taking that moment to recognize that this is an important issue, that we are all facing this issue, and that we're going to take on this issue. And I think the power of this room is not just on the panel, it's the power of everybody in this room to really challenge, resist, question, and ask for a better place that we can live in that actually supports people to come forward and says to survivors, I believe you. It's not your fault. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're safe. I'm gonna connect you with other people that can give you support. Because we have to remember, and I think that's been said time and time again, that we have to create a survivor-centric space and not a space that is celebrating perpetrators, but actually saying to perpetrators, get it together 
as Mary said, what was it? If you're not with us, you're against us. <laughs> And so I want to thank the Upper Canada, uh, the Law Society of Upper Canada for having us here and thank Leif. And I, now I think Leif is going to speak. Yeah. Sorry, before Leif speaks, I just feel there might have been a, a comment that was maybe um, a, a concerning around trans folks. Um, yes. No, that was around boys coming in ba girls' bathrooms. Yes. Um, so I feel like I just do need to say that, that our threat for, for girls in bathrooms are not from... Um, Trans, transgender folks, and I felt like I couldn't let that sit, that that's not the threat for young folks. I'm happy to talk with you about that later, about why I would say that, but I'm feeling in terms of wanting to be an ally to our trans um, communities, that um, that's a lot of misinformation that's there to scare you, that trans folks aren't coming in and hurting kids in bathrooms. Thank you, Thank you for that. Hi everyone, I'm Kim Stanton. I'm the legal director at LEAF. It's my honor and privilege to um, be able to thank um, our panelists this evening. Um, uh, on behalf of the co-organizers, LEAF, uh, the Schleifer Clinic, the Women's Law Association, the OBA Women's Lawyers Forum, and the Law Society. Um, obviously, when we started organizing this panel, we wanted to have a dialogue about sexual violence. Uh, we also wanted to have an intergenerational dialogue, and I think you can see how valuable that is. Um, we have so much to learn from one another. We have so many things, um, if we can take the time to not just talk to one another, but to listen to one another, um, to learn. It's, uh, it's just been a really remarkable panel. And I want to thank the panelists. Um, as a token of our appreciation, the Law Society has made a donation um, on your behalf to the uh, Lawyers Feed the Hungry program. And uh, if you're not headed over to the Up for Debate event across the street, which if you don't know about it, go to upfordebate.ca to learn about um, a wonderful campaign across the country of over 160 women's organizations getting together to have a debate about women's issues in the next election. Um, you can join us upstairs in Convocation Hall for a bit more discussion and dialogue about these important issues. I also just wanted to also thank Jennifer and the team at the Equity Initiatives uh, Department here at the Law Society who worked very hard to put this together. And thanks to all of you for coming. It's a full house and we have people online as well. It's really wonderful to know that people are engaging with these issues in the way that they are. So thanks to our panelists and thanks to all of you. Happy International Women's Day. Thank you.